Good morning. Thank you for having me today. And I would like to thank the IFFGD for addressing this really important issue. I will be talking to you today about cyclic vomiting syndrome and cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. What a physician should know. These are my disclosures. Cyclic vomiting syndrome has actually been around for several years and in fact, centuries. This is one of the first few reports of CVS by a pediatrician. And this was first reported by this doctor by name Samuel G who said that there were 14 children who had fitful or recurrent vomiting. These reports first appeared in the St. Bart's Hospital Reports Journal in 1882. It is also curious that uh, there are several important prominent persons who had CVS and CVS can actually afflict patients of all ages and socioeconomic strata. This is a picture of Charles Darwin and this is actually a letter that he wrote to some officers and he apparently was going to host some of these people, but he was unable to even come down to dinner because he had this violent episode of vomiting that lasted. And so this was a letter that he wrote to these three officers from the Beagle. And so CVS can really affect a lot of people. Why is CVS important? Now CVS is common, even though it's thought to be rare, it is mostly because it's either underdiagnosed or misdiagnosed. The prevalence of CVS in adults based on a population-based study is around 2%. The prevalence in children is also similar. CVS is also very expensive. The total cost of CVS is about 400 million from just inpatient hospitalizations over two years. And this was done based on what we call an NIS database, which looks at a national database of inpatient hospitalizations. And so you can clearly tell that there is a huge impact due to CVS. What about diagnosing CVS? Unfortunately, CVS does not have any biomarkers or blood tests to diagnose it, and we rely on something called the Rome criteria. So we have had two iterations of the Rome criteria. We have now have what is called the Rome 4 criteria, which is a set of clinical criteria to diagnose CVS. So essentially, if you have stereotypical episodes of vomiting, which are acute and onset, lasting less than a week, and you have three or more discrete episodes in the prior year, and you are either completely normal in between episode, episodes or have mild symptoms, you could have CBS. Obviously, your physician would conduct a few tests, such as like an upper endoscopy or a CT scan to make sure that there are no other GI conditions that could be causing the vomiting. And if these criteria are fulfilled for the last 12 months with symptom onset at least six months before diagnosis, then one can establish this diagnosis of CBS. Uh, again, there are some minor differences between row three and row four criteria that are not particularly important, but it is important to note that patients with CBS can have mild symptoms in between episodes. And now moving on to the clinical features, the clinical features are very characteristic. In general, CBS is consists of four phases that have been characterized by Dr. Fleischer, who is sort of like the grandfather of CVS, you have the inter-episodic phase where patients are typically either in normal health or can have mild symptoms. You have the prodromal phase where patients can experience multiple symptoms such as nausea, abdominal pain, um, abdominal pain, diarrhea, a sense of an impending sense of doom, etc. This is then followed by the emetic phase where patients will have nausea, vomiting, retching, and multiple autonomic symptoms such as diarrhea. Now, this emetic phase can last from a few hours to many days in patients and can be quite variable. And then you have the recovery phase. The importance of knowing these various phases is that abortive medications can be administered during the prodromal phase to try and abort or stop an episode. What about hot showers? Hot, the hot shower bathing pattern is something that is talked about a lot with regards to CBS and cannabis use. Essentially, patients with CBS will take multiple hot showers or baths during a CBS episode. And sometimes there are some patients who can even run out of hot water and check themselves into a hotel to have ready access to hot water. While 
the hot water bathing pattern has been associated very strongly with cannabis use, it's important to note that almost half the patients of CVS without cannabis also will report this hot water bathing pattern. What about the management of CVS? The management of CVS finally, uh, we finally published the guidelines on the management of CVS in adults last year. And so essentially once a diagnosis of CVS is made, a physician should try and help the patient identify and avoid triggers. Good sleep hygiene is important. Stress management is also important. Patients with CVS can have several comorbid conditions such as anxiety or depression, cannabis use, autonomic dysfunction, and migraine. And these also need to be treated and referrals may to be, need to be made. And one needs to assess the severity of CVS before determining what kind of treatment the patient needs. And essentially, this is an arbitrary definition of the severity of CVS. And in general, mild CVS is, is, is noted when patients have less than four episodes a year, when the episodes are very brief, lasting less than two days. There's a quick recovery from episodes, and patients in general have no ED visits or hospitalizations. And CVS is considered as moderate to severe when there are multiple episodes or greater than greater than four episodes a year. The episodes generally tend to be longer, and there's a long recovery from episodes, and there are multiple ED visits and hospitalizations. In general, abortive treatment is offered to all patients. Abortive treatment generally consists of tryptan, so intranasal somatryptan, Antiemetics like ondansetron, phenothiazine, and antihistaminics. And in addition to abortive treatment, prophylactic therapy should be offered to patients with moderate to severe CVS. Now, this is a consensus of the recommendations for the treatment of CVS. In general, if you have moderate to severe CVS, your physician should be prescribing or offering you medications like tricyclic antidepressants or amitriptyline, which is considered first-line prophylactic medication. Unfortunately, there are no randomized controlled trials in CVS and the quality of evidence is low, but be as it may, this is effective therapy. Other alternative medications for CVS include topramate as prophylaxis and also apripotent. Apripotent or emin is a newer medication and can be used for both prophylaxis and aborting CVS episodes. However, the cost can be quite prohibitive as many insurance companies may not cover this. There are other um, anti-epileptic agents such as sonosamide and such that can be offered to patients. There are mitochondrial supplements, including CoQ10 and riboflavin as well, which can be used. And as I mentioned earlier, the abortive medication such as sumatriptan or intranas intranasally is very helpful. Uh, I think most people would use ondansetron and then apreptant is also a newer medication <clears throat> that can be used to abort symptoms of a CVS episode. Very often we will have patients take all of these medications together. It is also very important that physicians screen and treat for comorbid conditions like anxiety and depression, migraine headaches, sleep disorders, autonomic dysfunction, and substance use. And finally, a note about other techniques, complementary therapies like meditation, relaxation, and biofeedback can be very helpful, particularly with stress management and improving the overall quality of life of CVS patients. And uh, one pointer here that it is very, very important to take the rescue medications as early as possible in a CBS episode to abort symptoms. Now, switching gears a little bit, what about cannabis? Cannabis in CBS is very common and almost 40% of patients with cyclic vomiting syndrome use cannabis. And so I think we need to discuss this a little bit. What about cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome? CHS is a condition that is similar to CVS, so it is characterized for the same stereotypical episodic vomiting that we see in CVS. 
However, there is an association with prolonged excessive cannabis use, and there should be relief of vomiting episodes by sustained cessation of cannabis use. And so while the wrong criteria doesn't quite define what sustained cessation means, most experts would recommend that you need to be off cannabis for at least six months to a year to see if there is any change in your symptoms. Again, CHS can be associated with this pathological hot water bathing behavior that we discussed. And before talking a little more about the risks and possible benefits of cannabinoids or cannabis, we need to know what are cannabinoids. So cannabinoids are compounds that have an affinity of what we call cannabinoid receptors that we have in the body. These are densely distributed in various areas in the body, including, including the, the brain and the nausea and vomiting and the vomiting center in the brain. There are three types of cannabinoids. We have phytocannabinoids and endocannabinoids and synthetic cannabinoids. Phytocannabinoids are derived from plants. Endocannabinoids are actually synthesized in humans. So we produce substances like marijuana in our body. What about phytocannabinoids? Typically, the marijuana or cannabis that is uh, consumed in the market is derived from two plant species, cannabis sativa and uh, less often cannabis indica. And while they can contain many, many compounds, the most important compounds that are found or of importance are tetrahydrocannabinol or THC and cannabinoid or CBD. And I think there's a lot of interest in CBD. And the reason for that is that it is not psychoactive. So it does not give you the high that THC gives it. And it also actually is not technically a cannabinoid because it acts on 5-HT1A receptors and not the cannabinoid receptors. Cannabis concentrates can be particularly harmful. The risks of physical dependence and addiction increase with exposure to high con concentrations of THC. Higher concentrations of THC can actually produce anxiety, agitation, paranoia, and psychosis. And it is thought that it has a bi-basic effect. So low doses of cannabis may be okay, but high, higher doses may result in hyperemesis. This is an important slide that I would like both patients and physicians to focus on. And this looks actually at the percentage of THC and CBD in cannabis samples that were seized by the DEA. And here you have in the 1990s. So in 1995, the concentration of THC was around 4%. And as you can see, there is a dramatic increase and we are now at around 15%. And this is just the percentage of THC that you would see, say, in a joint. If you look at cannabis concentrate, because of the way cannabis products are produced these days, the amount of THC or the concentration of THC in these products can be very, very high. And it can be upwards of 70% at times, even greater than 80%. So it's really important to know what you are using and what the concentration of THC would be. For example, dabbers can inhale an entire amount in a single breath, and this delivers really large amounts of THC to the body very quickly. In contrast, the THC, as I said, in a marijuana, say, joint or a cigarette is 15%, but again, this is so much higher than what it was in the 90s. And so I think it's a, it's a very different beast uh, that we have out there today. So we really need to know, is this good or bad, right? And what are the problems with cannabis? Unfortunately, this is a study that looks at ED related um, hospital, ED related visits, uh, and this is related to marijuana tourism in Colorado. And so this is around the time that marijuana got legalized in Colorado. And if you look at out of state patients, a lot of patients actually go to um, Colorado, and this is part of the marijuana tourism. And so there was a significant increase in ED visits by out of state residents. And so I think it's important to understand this a little better. Is this because people are using more cannabis or is it because uh, CBS is being recognized more is not clear. And now we also looked at cyclic vomiting presentations following marijuana liberaliz liberalization in Colorado and the ED visits clearly increased and, and doubled over this time. Uh, again, it's 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 hard to understand if these were patients previously diagnosed with gastroparesis. Was there an increased recognition of this vomiting pattern by ED physicians who didn't really know much about CBS before marijuana came around? 
or is it because of increased reporting of cannabis use by patients because it's been legalized? Again, it's probably a combination of all of these factors. And uh, so we looked at patterns of cannabis use in patients with CVS. This was a study that we did. And as you can see, this part of the pie, around 60% of patients don't use cannabis at all. And 22% of patients, so one in five patients, reported that they use cannabis more than four times a week. And in general, the, these are the chronic users or the chronic heavy users, daily or near daily cannabis use, which can be problematic. However, when you ask them about their cannabis use, uh, the patients actually reported that it improved their symptoms. So this actually is, is a figure that looks at the percentage improvement in symptoms with cannabis use. And, and a significant proportion of patients reported that there was a reduction in vomiting episodes, severity of vomiting, abdominal pain, appetite, and some people even said that they were able to avoid ED visits and hospitalizations, and they were able to continue working and also studying. Again, it is important to note that this is a patient report. And coming back to the other study I spoke about, uh, we did look at some of our patients. And then when we looked at patients who were cannabis users who abstained from cannabis for at least a month, there was only one patient who reported resolution of symptoms following cannabis cessation. But this patient actually subsequently resumed his use with higher CBD content and remained symptom free. And so the rest of them really said that they didn't find any major improvement. But however, I think a longer follow up is needed because the patients in the study had been off cannabis for only a month. And it's really important to be off cannabis for a longer period of time. And uh, we looked at the role of uh, cannabis in cyclic vomiting syndrome in CHS, and we actually looked at 105 individual cases and 25 case series. And when we looked at this, this is an important slide. Uh, though these cases said that these patients had CHS, there was no significant follow up, and there was actually a lack of detail in these studies in the literature. So I think there are some limitations. For example, if you look at how many people were followed for greater than four weeks following abstinence, only a small proportion of these case reports and case series had this particular follow-up. And then if you look at the number of people who actually met Rome criteria, again, I want to point out that these cases and case series were reported before the Rome four criteria. And so there was only a very small proportion, 14 and 20%, who actually met diagnostic criteria for CHS. So it's really not clear if all these people who were reported as having CHS in the literature really had cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. And so I think it's a little difficult to, uh, to know. We do not have enough uh, good understanding. I think it's important to know that the cannabis products that are out there can be very potent. There is there are also studies showing that some people are genetically predisposed to the adverse effects from cannabis. And I spoke about endocannabinoids in the body and endocannabinoids are compounds actually that are very important. They are marijuana like substances that we produce in the body and are very important in the regulation of nausea and vomiting. So there could be an endocannabinoid deficiency. And finally, as I said, the potency of cannabis products is also a problem. So I think it is really important to keep these things in mind. Uh, there is certainly a big debate that rages about whether it's good or bad. We need more funding and research. In the meantime, the takeaway point is if you're going to use cannabis, um, it's probably best not to use cannabis if you have cyclic vomiting. And if you are, certainly occasional use may be okay, but near daily, daily or chronic use is going to be is really going to be detrimental. And uh, finally, I'd like to acknowledge all of these people. Uh, some of these are my mentors. This is B. Lee, who is sort of the guru in pediatric CVS. Some of the other researchers who've done studies with me, and uh, <clears throat> my nursing team, who um, really take care of these patients. And it would not be possible without them to do this work that I do. And, um, and Kathleen Adams is actually the former president and founder of the Cyclic Vomiting Syndrome Association. Again, uh, thank you for listening.